few tests of security and it seems to have stood up so far, keeping four very primal security principles that I think anyone would desire, and I'll be going over those when I talk about my solution. My solution is called Anvil. Uh, any questions about Lightning Networks before I continue on to the work that I am probably too proud of? All right. So Anvil is an interesting name. It doesn't really make much sense uh, until you think about Lightning Networks. And so Anvil is designed to be a platform for generating Lightning Networks. Um, this is the new name, though. Originally, I named it Corona, and this is a name that came out of 2019 and before COVID. I think it was actually spring 2019. And if this isn't a lesson in being flexible with the names of your papers, I don't know what is because I don't think I could be working on a paper called Corona and not being focused on the coronavirus at this time. So it's called Anvil now. Uh, and that's that's the brief story I wanted to share with everyone as far as me freaking out. Uh, so what is Anvil? Anvil is a platform for initiating permission multi-party lightning networks, uh, which I will try my best to refer to as PMLNs from now on. Uh, a permission multi-party lightning network is a lightning network that is permissioned. So that is a, uh, when we, I was describing that previously, that's the one where we, of course, know all the members. So all the members are created initially and transactions are handled. Uh, and those transactions are then submitted to the main chain layer. It combines existing lightning network technologies with threshold encryption to enable spontaneous sidechain network development on permissionless settings like Bitcoin. So this is potentially a metric for creating trusted problem proposals for the uh, proof of utility. So proof of utility on its own has that problem proposal dilemma. However, if you base the problems that are proposed on a provenant database like Bitcoin, then you might not have as much of that problem and can use it in short bursts, which then means that transactions can be handled on a more safe network. How does Anvil work? Uh, Anvil has five components, roughly. It's got the protocol, which is defined in the Anvil contract. Uh, it's the protocol that's being used to establish in-network consensus. This could be something similar, simple. It could just be um, three systems owned by the same person, but it should be defined within the Anvil contract that is submitted to the Bitcoin network. It's got the fees, which are the amount of currency taken by PMLN servers as part of the payment, similar to Bitcoin fees. Uh, you need incentive to actually participate honestly in this network. It's got the number of, P it's got all the addresses of the PMLN servers, so you know who to connect to. It's got the address, the unique ID of the network, which is actually that parent address that was talked about before for the Lightning Networks. That's being reused as a PMLN address, and it, it lends itself to some very nice security proofs. Uh, and it's got, of course, the transactions that are interacting between clients. These are actually those child transactions before. Um, so simply think of that simple two or three party model of the Lightning Network uh, just being extended over time. And adding threshold encryption because novelty, but also because trust. Uh, so the contract to initiate off-chain transaction networks, instead of being done by participants of the transaction, um, which you could have seen up here on the Lightning Network side, talked about participants, these are actually done these are actions that are done by the PMLN servers uh, in the middle of co communication between uh, members of members who choose to use the PMLN. And so first they create the parent transaction, they create the children transactions with the fees, sign the children exchange the signatures, sign the parent, exchange the signature and broadcast the parent. However, these steps two through six continue to happen on loop and the parent transaction continues to be the same uh, while the permission network is alive. Uh, so here's an example of that proof of utility that I was mentioning before. Um, so suppose a company like IBM has some problem solved within some threshold of a solution. So say they'd like accuracy to 99.999% of the solution for some convolutional neural network. IBM submits the offer to any number of Bitcoin members who are using Anvil to, provide, to build a proof, proof of utility network with stepped thresholds to resolve this problem alongside a financial reward. So for example, IBM says they will give $10,000 to the group of members uh, uh, who participate in an Anvil proof of utility network uh, at different steps. So say you want 50% um, improvement every time. So the first member to create a threshold of, uh, or to, to 
generate a spontaneous 50% accurate threshold, they get moved on, and then you increase it, and that's the step function. And so you get to 99.999% accuracy in the convolutional neural network. There's some papers that are done on this regard, and I think most of them are experimental. A company like Coinbase employs Anvil and accepts the offer. Uh, so Coinbase is a transaction company like PayPal, um, who would have a high incentive to use something like a PMLN, whether to participate in these kinds of transactions or to participate with PayPal. Um, having a PMLN doesn't have to be used for proof of utility, it could be used for anything. And to have a system that would allow Coinbase and PayPal to interact natively on Bitcoin could reduce a lot of wasted computation because those are probably two large sources of Bitcoin transactions. And I say probably in that they definitively are. Uh, Coinbase uses a proof of utility network to resolve its in-house transactions between members of Coinbase without environmental harm and with financial gain because they are gaining that $10,000 that IBM asked uh, in return for the mining of the system. And they also get those taxes as well. And so they're able to have more trust over their own system. Not only is it um, helping the environment, but it's also doing a really good job decreasing the latency. When you have to wait a series of transactions to get your transaction submitted to a chain, uh, that can take quite a bit of time. If you submit to a PMLN you trust, once it's committed in the PMLN, you don't need to worry about it as long as you and the person you're transacting with both trust that PMLN, which in a situation like Coinbase, there's very little reason not to. So what does this look like um, over time, of course? So for example, we have a main chain defined by this line up here, and here's the PMLN that's generated for a short period of time. So here's the initiating contract for the PMLN that spawns the PMLN. Now some sender transacts with the PMLN to initiate the sending, and some receiver transacts to sign their contracts that they've been sent by the, by the sender. That transaction is then sent back to the main chain. Suppose they do that once again, but the PMLN has completed and it dies. Of course, these are not the only two people using the PMLN, so just keep that in mind. Then they can, of course, just use the traditional Lightning Network to interact off-chain. Additionally, uh, sorry, that's this example. Or, or they can just use the Bitcoin network properly. Um, and those are all options. However, when you're using a PMLN, not only should you trust the PMLN, you should verify. <laughs> You should always trust but verify, but the same is true for just traditional Lightning Network contracts as well. Uh, when one party signs and delivers and the other party signs and delivers, it is possible that one party could sign and not deliver the Lightning contract to the network. Uh, take, for example, this case. In this case, uh, it's the receiver who actually sends that contract to the Lightning Network. And so you have the ability to send the transaction in your own hands. What security properties does this have? Well, it has basically all of the same security properties as Lightning Networks uh, in that it has balanced security, serializability, value privacy, and sender receiver anonymity. However, these properties are only maintained between members and the PMLN they trust. So rather than in the original network where sender receiver anonymity exists between all members of the Lightning Network, the PMLN by being uh, owners of the parent transaction do have a bit of insight that they otherwise would not have. And so your PMLN that you use should be trusted. Um, otherwise, of course, value, balance security, unless you have a quantum computer that can reverse engineer these uh, signatures, you're not gonna get through that. Serializability, if the PMLN itself is a blockchain, you're not gonna get through that. Value privacy, um, as long as you trust the PMLNs, the individual transactions, it's, you can't tell because it's just a single end state by the parent transaction and children transactions. And sender receiver anonymity, um, again, just using a threshold voucher system with that threshold encryption, the anonymity is preserved. Uh, remaining work. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to ask questions for a second just to go over this, and then it will be a long period for questions in, in just a minute. Uh, so th this design has presented a safe procedure to begin, use, and terminate PMLN based on a network like Bitcoin. Um, I have done my best to have security proofs that extend Lightning Network security to Anvil, and I, I believe that those proofs are solid, but I haven't put them through any uh, um, formal methods or anything like that. Um, and of course, you should trust the PMLN you're interacting with, just as you should, in theory, trust the person you're transacting with on a Lightning Network, though there's far less risk in that case because no one owns a parent transaction. 
Um, but I still have quite a few open questions because this is a work in progress and I, I don't plan to have it done until um, next year. And, and one of the fundamentals is what's the best way to test this? Do I try to build a proof of utility network? Um, that feels like a lot of work and it feels like not just one step. So I, I think I don't, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, how do we more readily transfer data between the main chain and the PMLN? Because of course they have to interact over that parent transaction and that can cause latency and can be difficult to do. And can we use peg side chains to uh, communicate between PMLNs? That's something I really just don't understand. Um, I don't know if it's secure to do that. A pegged side chain means that you have two chains that um, base transactions on each other and the states of each other. And so uh, you could theoretically build a pegged side chain to connect Ethereum and Bitcoin. And there is evidence that that has been done um, to make sure there's reliability of both, but I'm not exactly sure the security proofs necessary to make that happen in one of my PMLNs, especially when I could have a um, non-Infinium type network that is built on it because it could just terminate and that's fine. So I don't know if peg sidechains necessarily work in that context. I haven't spent the time to figure that out. Uh, and finally, do any of you have any questions for me? Um, type them up, ask them, unmute. Um, yeah. Thank you, I, I think. Stopped getting feedback a while back, so I'm not sure if I lost everyone. So I like the question, what is the best way to test this? Because this comes up a lot with blockchains, right? Right, absolutely. Um, do you have any ideas for how to test it? Like, how do you integrate with existing blockchains to try and make something like this work? Because making a blockchain from scratch to work with doesn't sound like the plan, right? Right, right, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I'm my first instinct at this time is to build a Bitcoin test bed and just have a dummy um, PMLN and and use emulytics to basically bombard the Bitcoin test bed and see if my PMLN functions better than the typical transaction, but that just feels like such an engineered situation that it doesn't seem like it would actually test the legitimacy of this in the real world. I mean, one idea is you could try finding another project that's working on sort of the permissionless blockchain side and try to integrate with that. But it's not an easy question to answer, I think. Because, you know, reviewers are probably going to be harsh on almost any route you take with, with the testing. I completely agree. I'm I'm just I'm just saving this as notes from this at this point, which feels appropriate to do. Can you talk about um how this fits into your vision for your dissertation? I absolutely can. Yeah. So um I am for my dissertation looking to build a series of papers uh that uh allow me to work toward a unified theory for consensus theory. Um, when we talk about consensus algorithms and Bitcoin and blockchain and PBFT and BEAT and Hyperledger and on and on and on and on, um, as, as I like to say, uh, there are probably millions of these and half of them are isomorphic to the other half, if not much more overlap than that. Um, fundamentally, what's missing is a unified theory for consensus theory. Um, and, and by isomorphic, I mean that PBFT is so much like so many of the other algorithms that have come directly after it or even before it, it just uses a specific type of agreement and a specific type of broadcast. And, and that's different than, for example, Bitcoin, right? The proof of work uses a totally different series of primitives, um, but fundamentally proof of work is not all that different from, like Bitcoin is not all that different from Zcash, even though they're both proof of work and have different algorithms, they are fundamentally the same. And so I'm working on um, for my dissertation, hopefully building a unified theory for consensus theory, um, the last of which seems to have been written in 1967. Um, and that's well before any of these algorithms were created. Um, as uh, Dr. Sherman uses the word, um, there's a stove piping in the field. And I'm, my goal in my dissertation is to um, help mitigate some of that. So this technology itself is hybrid permission. Uh, so it's permissioned that functions in permissionless. So any network that uses this, uh, you can extract the fundamental proofs of uh, consensus theory that allow this system to work. 
Uh, my other two papers are hybrid synchrony. So when you think about synchrony, you're thinking about something that's synchronous. I tell you, hey, I'm going to send you a message in two minutes, and in two minutes you listen, and if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. Partially synchronous, about two minutes. So you start listening two minutes, maybe you stop at about 10 minutes, you're like, yeah, I've given up. Or asynchronous, me telling you, hey, I'm going to send you a message, and you just listen from now until 200 million years from now when I finally send the message. Uh, so my other paper I worked on with Dr. Zhang called Flex uh, is, a, is a platform, it, once again, for uh, allowing any partially synchronous protocol to function in an asynchronous manner, um, which is how we can get consensus protocols and consensus algorithms to, we can have proofs that fund, uh, uh, fundamentally ignore time constraints. And so when you're ignoring time constraints, you're ignoring permissions. My next paper is uh, uh, that I'm working on is one for wireless sensor networks that is able to build a consensus theory that has uh, the opportunity for crash fault tolerance, but also for Byzantine fault tolerance. And so now there's a hybrid fault tolerance, and the fundamental proofs in there would be without regard to fault tolerance and simply with regard to consensus. And hopefully, by combining those three papers and the fundamental proofs with those three papers, I can build a good basis for consensus theory writ large. I, I take no issue just standing here awkwardly. Are there any more questions? So if not, I'd like to thank our speaker, Cyrus Bonyati, and I look forward to connecting with all of you in two weeks. Um, by the way, um, we record these and the recordings uh, are posted and will be posted on the UMBC um, Center for Cybersecurity. I I forgot to press record um, at the beginning of the talk, but I got it after about 20 minutes. Thank you very much. It looks like good work. Thank you.